My name is uh, John Culver. I'm here with the uh, world famous AT6 SNJ Texan, affectionately known as the War Dog. This uh, aircraft was built in World War II here in. Uh, it's a North American built aircraft, the two plants. One was in uh, El Segundo, one was in Dallas, Texas. The War Dog here was built in Dallas, Texas in November 1944 and was commissioned as a Marine uh, in December and flown down to uh, El, uh, El Toro as a first base command um, and uh, first assignments. And uh, after that point, it went down to uh, Marine, what is now called Marine Corps uh, Miramar and has uh, flown numerous missions since then as a training. It's an advanced trainer. And all across the country, left and right, uh, back and forth on the country from Pensacola um, all the way up into Alameda. In 1957, it was decommissioned from the Marine Corps and put into scrap, where at that point, the Japanese Self-Defense Force, basically like our Coast Guard, bought many, many of these aircraft to surplus and they were disassembled in Alameda and sent to Japan for that uh, self-defense force uh, tour. And it's the active duty until 1974. It was repainted uh, yellow and with the Japanese emblem, we called affectionately the meatball on the side. And the aircraft flew in that uh, defense force uh, for a number of years till 1974. Then it was decommissioned from the Japanese government as surplus. At that point, many of us collectors uh, scour the world for things of this nature and we found this aircraft, this particular one, for $500 and bought it as basically scrap and uh, several of them were purchased for that price and brought back over on a ship from Japan back to Alameda and at that point it was rebuilt down in uh, Compton Airport here locally here uh, with uh, Warbirds West and that aircraft, uh, in fact many of these aircraft just like this were, oh probably about 10 of them were rebuilt and uh, we were very fortunate to have this piece of history. I call it sort of like flying a monument or salute to the Navy, Marine Corps. And this particular airplane here has been in uh, our family uh, for almost 25 years. I bought the aircraft uh, in the intent of flying and sharing it with the public. Uh, so I stepped out into the air show arena after flying corporate for Northrop Grumman for many years. And at that time, uh, kind of shared uh, both uh, flying Northrop Grumman and uh, flying this at the air shows, and I accumulated about 20, almost 20 years worth of, of flying at that point, and then went into full-time air shows with this as I retired off of Northrop and flying the King Air 200s and so on. My total flight time right now, I'm sitting at about 14,000 hours, and I learned to fly when I was a kid. In fact, this airport, Torrance Airport, back in 1967, I used to ride my bicycle down here to go look at airplanes and get a job sweeping out hangars and kind of, boy, I save up my, my pennies and go for an airplane ride in a little Cessna 150, and I was hooked. I was absolutely hooked. My father was a World War II vet. Uh, however, surprisingly, he never flew. Uh, aircraft. He wanted to, but due to some health issues, he couldn't make it and uh, for the flying of aircraft. But um, he uh, got that spark into me. And uh, so here I am today. What am I doing? Flying a World War II aircraft in his honor. He had passed away several years ago. But uh, the aircraft that I'm flying here, the Texan, I do at many air shows, such as the uh, Point Magoo Air Show, Edwards Air Force Base Air Show, Miramar, and formerly the El Toro Show, where this aircraft was originally based. And um, the salute I fly, it's called a salute to the Armed Force Veterans, and paying homage to my father, who is not gone, but was a vet. So we've gone full circle now, and I'm flying this show for him. And it's an aerobatic show. Basically, it's not a stunt show. It's really uh, the maneuvers that were taught to the World War II pilots, basically, to win the war. So it's the loops and the rolls and the Cubanates and so on of that nature. And the only thing different on this plane that's modified is the fact that we have a smoke system on there for air show smoke, we call it, like sky riding, so you can trace the aircraft across the sky and I choreograph my performance with music the music appropriately from the movie Pearl Harbor <laughs> so it really is a good fit and with the nar proper narration at these air shows it is really is a good fit and what to me is the most exhilarating portion of my performance when I come back and I meet a lot of these veterans that are out here that well they're all about seven, late 70s, early 80s now, and it takes them back, back when they were in their early 20s, you know, young cadet getting their wings in these aircraft. And I've met some wonderful people over the years, and many, many times they'll come up to me and, and ask me questions, and they'd have a tear in their eye, which is just to me, 
there's no monetary value to that and I'm glad I could bring them back to those years of their you know youthfulness and flying these aircraft the sights and sounds that you don't get anymore and so I'm very fortunate again backing up to being able to fly this monument and a salute to our veterans of the US military what we're looking at here of course is our World War II uh, AT-6 SNJ Texan and this aircraft affectionately is called the War Dog, as you see the Bulldog on the side. This was a Marine Corps advanced training aircraft, and of course the Bulldog is the uh, representative of the Marine Corps. And so you take the uh, W and the D for War Dog, and you look back at the tail over here, and you'll see a WD, which marks the squadron's identification at El Toro, which was its first stopping point after it was assembled for World War II. And how WD actually started was the aircraft again was initially stationed at El Toro, California in Santa Ana. Well, the air, the air station was brand new at that time and they usually have a mascot for the uh, air station. They didn't have any right off the bat with the war issue going, but uh, a neighbor of uh, the El Toro area in Santa Ana was a guy named Walt Disney. And he came up with this logo which became Ferdinand the Bull. And all they did with the Ferdinand the Bull cartoon character was put wings on him. He drew wings on him for it. And that became accepted as the squadron logo. So in reciprocation, the Marine Corps at El Toro used his initials, WD, Walt Disney, as one of their squadron uh, identifiers, as you can see on the tail of the war dog. And so the WD again was Walt Disney. And in reciprocation, uh, they put the WD on the tail of their squadron. And that stayed active all the way until the closure of the base for the base realignment uh, until 1993-94 the Super Hornet I should say the F-18 Hornets were flying out of there had the WD still on the tail since World War II since the inception of the base so it was a long going history in addition to the interesting uh, background of this aircraft uh, and its history it sports a uh, Pratt & Whitney engine Wasp Junior engine it's got nine cylinders produces 600 horsepower at full power on the uh, ground roll takeoff uh, here at sea level and it consumes anywhere from 30 gallons an hour minimum to a maximum of 60 for aerobatic or combat type flying this engine here has been replaced oh three or four times on the aircraft since I've owned it they last maybe about a thousand five hundred hours um, on the side of the plane on inside the plane and then it's time for overhaul so it's gone through several engines and uh, just a matter of general routine maintenance on uh, the aircraft the propeller is a two blade uh, Hamilton standard propeller and it's 108 inches long and obviously pulls the aircraft through the sky and the maximum speed for this aircraft is 250 miles per hour in a dive the air, aircraft actually just cruises at normally at about 170 so it was an advanced trainer had all the systems of the F4U Corsair or the Hellcat or even the P-51 Mustang of the Army Air Corps fame um, so it has retractable landing gear uh, fold up in flight and they go up inside the wings under hydraulic pressure and then releases for the handle inside for the pilot to drop down and lock down into the locked position uh, very reliable aircraft in addition because this was a marine aircraft it had application for the Navy and also was used on carrier training so what happened here was this aircraft in 1950, 51, 52 was actually put on board an aircraft carrier for advanced training for basically cadet pilots in the Navy Marine Corps to learn how to land on a carrier. So this aircraft was uh, positioned in uh, World War II for uh, after World War II as a advanced trainer for the Marines and the Navy for aircraft ap at carrier application and it was put on the USS Cabot and uh, was taken off in landings uh, which was out near Pensacola and uh, a lot of the cadets were learning how to come in and land and catch the carrier cable and uh, then launch off a carrier again. It was a trainer carrier, uh, trainer aircraft so this aircraft has probably had a quite a few well, historic landings, shall we say, in its time, and it had a tail hook at one point in time as well. Um, so, as you can see now, we don't sport the tail hook. Uh, no need to land on carriers anymore. I think we leave that up to the the modern jets and the navy of today. But uh, we certainly, again, enjoy flying this airplane because it is a monument, and again, a salute to the uh, fighter pilots of World War II and all of our veterans. 
This aircraft weighs in with full fuel and two pilots complement at about almost 6,000 pounds. Fairly heavy for a trainer, so a guy, a cadet, could get in trouble real easy with it. And of course, even though it sports 600 horsepower engine with a supercharger, you always feel like you need another two or 300 more horsepower. Uh, especially, I'm sure, after launching off one of those short aircraft carrier decks. But uh, anyway, it's a, it's a lot of fun to fly. I would liken it to maybe taking it for a ride on a, taking yourself for a ride on a Harley motorcycle or something of that nature. We call it affectionately the Sky Harley because of the sound, of the throaty sound of this particular engine too as well. There are approximately 450 to almost 500 examples of this air type aircraft flying in the world today. And um, they were active duty until 1996 in South Africa and they retired those aircraft just recently. However, in further research, the, the Turkish Air Force is still using these as close air support with rockets and bombs. And uh, so it gives you an idea how reliable and what a good design this aircraft has been over the years. Originally designed in 1938 as a BC-1 all the way through to the AT-6 uh, SNJ-K models. So uh, it's, it's had a long life and <laughs> militarily, which they were designed for, it's still active duty and of course we're very, very fortunate to have it in civilian hands here in the U.S. and, and I'm very very proud of what we have here. Okay, what we're looking at is there's a two-seater aircraft. The instructor pilot sat in the back or tail gunner. The front seat, of course, was the cadet or the pilot, is the pilot. And what we're looking at here is the front seat. This is one of the original control panels that you have, would have seen in any one of these type aircraft from 1938 on. The only thing different we have here, of course, is a modern VHF two-way radio with all the appropriate frequencies as well as the transponder encoder. And, of course, the smoke system and switch, we've replaced that switch with, uh, well, we put that switch in and replaced the bombs. And um, what we're looking at is the tachometer for the engine, the manifold pressure, and, of course, altimeter, airspeed, um, and compass gyros. Um, in addition, of course, because we do the aerobatic performance in the shows, we have a G-meter put in, which measures our G-units, or how much we pull in, in gravity, for doing loops and stuff of that nature, so that we keep the aircraft well within its design limits. And the control stick <coughs> is in the middle. That's what you, the pilot holds on to with his right hand. There's a little red button on the top for the machine gun and a trigger on the opposite side. And below that, we see the rudder pedals, which, you know, is your left and right that controls the pedals or the uh, surface on the back of the aircraft, most like a boat. So really everything is nice, cozy, and right in front of the pilot. And uh, so there's no need to look around or a hodgepodge panel like where you're looking for an altimeter on one side of the panel or airspeed on the other. It's all right in front of you, just like the fighters were designed. In fact, it's the same layout like the F-8 Bearcat or the F-4U Corsair or the F-6 Hellcat.